Hi, I'm Stephen Foskett from Foskett's.net and Tech Field Day. And I'm here at the Cartoon Art Museum at VMworld 2012 talking about Scale Computing's new conversion structure product, HC3. I have a panel of people here who are going to join me in discussing this product. Many of these folks are independent bloggers and experts in fields of server virtualization and storage. Others are actually uh, part of the Scale team. So before we start, let's just quickly go around through the group of us and introduce ourselves to say, you know, just who you are and where you're from, okay? So again, I'm Stephen Foskett from blog.foskett.net. I'm Jeff Reedy, uh, CEO and co-founder of Scale Computing. Uh, Colin McNamara, blogger, colinmcnamara.com. Jason Collier, CTO and uh, co-founder of Scale Computing. Brian Adsma, uh, blogger at techmangelist.net. Uh, Howard Marks, I'm an industry analyst at DeepStorage.net, uh, right at NetworkComputing.com. Bill Hill from VirtualBill.WordPress.com. Roger Lund, Roger.com, BeBrainStorm.com. Fabio Roselli, Juku.it. Patrick Conti, the EVP of Field Operations at Scale. All right, very good. So, um, now, we've just had a, a briefing about scale computing today. Uh, you guys just introduced today your new HC3 converged computing product. Um, everybody here has now heard a little bit about the product. Many of us had pre-briefings as well. Um, what led you guys to the converged computing space? Maybe I should talk to you as the CEO and <laughs> co-founder. What, what, sure. Why did you decide to do this? I mean, it was sort of it was the the vision for the company all along, and and really, um, I mean, Jason and I and, and some of the other co-founders all come from. Uh, managing IT in small and mid-sized organizations, and so we wanted to build a product uh, using modern technologies, virtualization and clustering and so on, but specifically build the product for the needs of small and mid-sized companies. Okay. And do you guys think that he succeeded? Who, want, who wants to take that from the, the audience? Well, the proof of the pudding's in the eating, but it sure looks like it. Uh, yeah, until I actually get one in the lab and beat it into submission, I, you know, there's questions about how well, but at first glance, you know, it's got a user interface that lets you easily create VMs, it takes multiple servers and makes them look like a single system, it covers a lot of the bases. What will be the submission word, Howard? Will it be Uncle or something else? <laughs> <laughs> Engage. That's the same word. <laughs> No, but an interesting thing of it is that uh, well, where I think it's uh, with your goal of making something accessible by you know, this mid market and small museum businesses. Um, frankly, uh, I think you guys are one of the first to market in, in, in a space that we're going to see more of. Right? The, the fact is, and we're all, we're all here at, uh, at a VMworld conference today, but the reality is, is customers around the world are, are kind of diversifying their choice of how they consume storage and compute. And uh, I was really impressed with the interface we were able to put onto this, uh, taking something that's fairly complicated. I mean, KVM is a fairly highly featured hypervisor. Um, and and you know, we can argue all day about KVM versus VMware, not the goal here. But to put something that makes it accessible to a user, be able to next, next, next install, and to your point, kick, kicks tires in the lab, but, but that, that, that's kind of important. And I think meaningful. Now, you mentioned KVM. Um, that's kind of the you know, <laughs> the elephant in the room, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is not the VMware based product. No. Do you, what do you think, what do you guys think the reaction in the market is going to be to that? I think that that space doesn't care. I mean, I mean, we've all been in this situation at some point in our career where we're one of like six or seven guys in a company and you, and you're, you just need to get it running, right? And, it, and not the hypervisor itself is not a differentiator anymore. There are many things that can actually run multiple VMs on one, one CPU. Yeah, the hypervisors are commodities. You know, yes. the, the efficiency difference between ESXi and KVM and Hyper-V and Xen, you know, it's two, three, five percent here and there. That what, what's made VMware successful is vCenter. It's yes. that there's it's, that management interface. Yeah. And these guys have put that management interface and then some on top of KVM, so, you know, it's kind of like going, you know, does it have rack and pinion steering? I don't care. You, you totally nailed that on the head. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, um, 
you know, the, the hypervisors themselves are a commodity today. I mean, it's like you know, nobody cares about those, those few percentage points of one that's better than the other. Um, where those guys are making the money, everybody that's actually out there selling hypervisors, it's on the management tools, it's not on the hypervisor itself. So, and then and effectively what we've done is basically, like you said, rolled um, basically our own management interface on top of that hypervisor. Number one question we get, if, if it even comes up, which often when we talk to customers, it doesn't. Uh, but even if it, if it comes up, what's the hypervisor, KVM, uh, I don't know it. Does it run Windows? Yes. Okay, great. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the main question. So. Well, the, the three of us, uh, Jeff, Jason, and myself, just got back from a four-week uh, tour out seeing our top 16 resellers in North America. And in, in doing that, we also uh, demoed this product to 60 end users. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and we ask them all the time, you know, what are the key things for you guys? What do you like about this, et cetera? Similar to the conversation we're having here. And we didn't get one customer out of that, out of that 60 that said that, that the, uh, VM, the lack of the, the hypervisor being VMware was gonna be a, a, a detriment to them making a choice to buy this product. Have you got any feel for how many of those customers were already running? A virtualized environment? Uh, yeah, we have, we have an idea. It was some, somewhere around a third. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. 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 The, the only reason I can see, you know, you want to, yeah. if you're in that, if you're that size, it's like, I want to run VMware because I'm running VMware. Well, we did get asked, Howard, about that. And, and, you know, the answer is just what, as Jason said, if, uh, if somebody's already running VMware or they're running Zen or they're running, uh, you know, Hyper-V, um, we can operate as a storage back end. In that particular case, you get the full benefit of the storage SAN capabilities, but at such time as that you may want to instantiate VMs underneath our, uh, our, our management layer, you can spin them up. Yeah, let me, so let, let me get let me tell you guys a story. Um, so I do my I do this seminar series on building virtual infrastructure, and at one of my seminars, a guy came up to me and he said, "This stuff this stuff sounds great, but it won't work in my VMware environment." And I was like, "Well, why wouldn't things like you know vMotion and DRS you know why couldn't you use those things?" And he said, well, "Because we're running the free version." <laughs> and it turned out that he had all the time like cobbled together this basically production business infrastructure based on free VMware. So it's like totally a freeloader on the VMware world. And it's like, well, no wonder nothing works for you. And I think it's like those kind of folks who are looking at Hyper-V and Zen and KVM and alternatives because they're not gonna go buy Enterprise Plus. No. Nothing in the world will make them buy it. And, and they, they would love to. They but they're not going to. It was like 17K a socket. <laughs> like they can't yeah, do it. Enterprise, so like, Enterprise Plus would double their infrastructure costs. Right. And that, you know, my, my last consulting client, you know, we just put in Essentials Plus. And yeah. I kind of miss storage vMotion, but. What are you going to do? Yeah, you, know, like, you, 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 you got to go from like seventy five hundred bucks for three servers to going to like you know I mean, like seventeen k a socket. Right. But, I mean, for, the, for that feature, you make a statement. VMware <laughs> deserves to make money. No company deserves to make money. Companies create products that earn the money. And VMware's products well, earn the money, yeah. especially when you're talking, you know. Plus, you know, enterprise. I mean, those products are great. But the reality is that a lot of the features that have earned that money in the past are becoming accessible using open source technologies. Yeah. And companies like Scale are implementing them and making them accessible. Yep. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, the, this the, creates a highly competitive market. And that's the, good. Yeah, it's, that's the great. story for Zen and KVM, you know, until these guys came around, <laughs> has been, they were great for. MSPs yeah. who yeah. have yeah. Linux guys around to manage them. Yeah, you got to be. And so if you go, you know, if you, you got to have some good dudes <laughs> to like yeah, manage that if, stuff. But if you're running, you know, an infrastructure as a service yeah. provider, and you've yeah. got yeah. a thousand physical servers and two thousand mm -hmm. customers. You better have those guys that are that yeah, good, absolutely. regardless of yeah. what you're running underneath. And yeah. once you've got those guys, then you go, hey, I don't need the fancy user interface. I got guys. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you've got a customer that's, let's just say, you know, 25, 50, 40, you know, this, uh -huh. this is a good fit too. If they want to look at the VDI from, what's your story there? What do you tell them? VDI for that environment works great. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I mean, if you want to take, like, so so our four node clusters, like 30 to 50 VMs virtualized in that, especially when you're talking like a persistent desktop style thing where you're not like basically shutting them down, powering them up, you know, just like leave them on. 
Uh, if you do that, you avoid boot storm issues. It works great. And actually, uh, <clears throat> our two uh, our two biggest vertical markets are the guys that use VDI the most on on our stuff. That's education and healthcare. So it's guys that want to spin up like, hey, you know, I, I need you know twenty five desktops like for for a class I'm doing, or you know, think about those you know hundred bed hospitals that you know have that little computer terminal in each room. It's basically running persistent desktop on VDI. Um, those those are primarily where we run it. If you want to run you know like five thousand desktops, you can go to Nutanix. Those guys can do it a hell of a lot better um, because they've got the tools to do managing those. You know that many um, uh, desktops. They've got the tools for that. We don't have the tools for that. We were joking in the office the other day that if we wanted to do large scale VDI, we'd go buy one of those guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yeah, you guys don't have the flash layer yet. No, it's like it's like, it's not our built customers. For it. I mean, when they're looking at VDI, it's usually, I mean, sometimes less than ten. You know, the clients are talking about or you know, twenties and thirties and forties. Yeah. Not yeah. Really you know, the hard part about being a traditionally is in the small market is the cost. You know, like oh, yeah, yeah. Cost, no, it's. Cost, cost, you know, yeah. it's just but yep. when you're talking about schools and hospitals, those aren't personal computers. There's five people that use that computer. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. Yeah. The, the resistance that people have to, no, I can't you know, put my kid's picture on the wallpaper. It's like, yeah, it's not yours. Your next school. shift is going to come in. It's a green screen. This is your VDI, right? Yeah. <laughs> How many years have you heard that? <laughs> oh, no. So I've seen, I, I honestly didn't get to see that much of it this yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. All the discussion. Yeah. So I work in higher ed. And, uh, one of, one of the issues that I've seen with this, not anything technical, I think it was fantastic in my organization. Um, one of the biggest issues is that when we look at new products, they bring them in and they say, we're certified for VMware, we're certified for Hyper-V, that's it. Um, I would be worried about calling support and having them go, okay, what platform are you on? And he's saying scale, and mm -hmm. going, sorry, that's it. So you talk uh, about applications. Yeah, applications. <laughs> I mean, ERP systems, databases, anything yeah. like that. Um, going across the board, mm -hmm. uh, most people, most organizations will, will look at something other than VMware or Hyper-V as there's a problem. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, of course, VMware went through that same thing, right? I and mean, that's just part of it goes with the territory. I and mean, we are, you know, Windows certified, so it runs on Windows, right? And that, that should be the case. But, you know, that said, we have a, a big initiative now where we're reaching out to ISVs um, about, you know, either certifying us or even pre-bundling, uh, you know, pre-configuring an, an ISO image effectively, right? So if I want to deploy, um, you know, Zimbra server, for example, right, it could be pre-configured to install on the HC3, so it effectively it's a one-click kind of install. So, yeah, I mean, out of the gate we have those challenges, you know, we're going to be Windows compatible and we're VMware certain and Citrix and you know, all that type of stuff. But you know, over time, you'll see us have more and more of these kind of cross cert partnerships. Yeah. So far, the several hundred customers we've engaged with, it's come up one time. It did come up, and it was exactly the scenario you're talking about. I, I, I can't remember exactly what the application was, but as Jeff said, we're engaged with you know, 100 plus application vendors today, and they're everything from system software guys, v to, you know, uh, uh, P to V, V to V, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, backup, all that kind of uh, software, uh, 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 system software, all the way through vertical applications. And there's a one guy we're engaged with that, that does a, a, a fundraising application uh, for uh, nonprofits. So it's that vertical of. Mm -hmm. yeah, and of course, the other thing is underneath we're running KVM. Right. So Red Hat has their own initiative to get these things certified mm -hmm. under the KVM, and so we were kind of coming at it from two, two sides. So, I, I, I agree, though, that that's one of those things that as time goes on, you guys should focus on making sure that you can improve your, yourselves in the certification lists and HCLs and things like that, because a lot of people really do look for that. Oh, yeah. So you know, I look forward to seeing that. But you're right, though. You are going to be able to pick, piggyback on Red Hat's efforts because Red Hat is really eager to get their stuff certified as well. Similarly, you know, you, you know, you're kind of piggybacking on, you know, IBM GPFS and the commodity, you know, hardware that you're using. I mean, you know, 
it's kind of amazing these days that a company can come out. You know, you guys don't have to like spin your own CPU. You know, I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's awesome. It's all it's all about the software. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. is it? it really is. So the topic that VMware is talking about is software defined. You know, <laughs> <laughs> does this count? Now that you guys have heard a little bit about software-defined storage and software-defined networking and software-defined infrastructure, does in, in your minds does this count as software-defined? No. Okay. No. I mean, I look at software-defined storage, server, networking, whatever, right, as applications consuming resources via an API. So I make a call. I want to. Uh, I need web servers. And calling up, spinning up machine instances, spinning up uh, elastic load balancing instances, the storage instances that, that attach to it. Now, you guys, are you guys exposing those APIs yet? Uh, sort of. That's my answer. <laughs> well, <it's>, uh, <laughs> well in, 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 my, in my opinion, yeah, it's not, our goal is that. Yeah, yeah but I mean, it's not appropriate for the market you're targeting, right? Mm. The most important thing to them is a new web interface, which you guys are working yeah, on. Yeah. Yeah. But no, but and I, guess what? Those make API calls, boom, but you know, yeah, yeah. In, in, in the back end, do that. But, yeah. I mean, I would argue this is more, you know, software defined infrastructure than some of the stuff Steve Harris was talking about this morning. Mm, software defined infrastructure? I think I just heard a new buzzword. <laughs> <laughs> well, Stephen couldn't come up with the last. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I did actually say that. You said software defined. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, the trans, it's, it's the Fosket English translation. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, when you start talking about, yeah, you run the you know, VMware VSA and SRM, it's like, yeah, okay. But they're shimming everything onto a hyper. You know, it's, it's, it's weird. Like, you see on, on, on one side of the house where you have storage, you look at all, this Silicon Valley contains stupidity, but, you know, all these, all, all these new clusters where, like, hey, my storage can actually do other things. And so, I mean, CPUs just get faster and faster. So, I mean, you know, that won't change for the foreseeable future. And VMware is trying to build something that draws people into their own product, but we're going to put everything on hypervisor. Oh, yeah, they're, they're they're trying to they're trying to be all things to all people. But with the with the kind of they're playing the game with the deck they already have, right? right? And, and, and they can't approach it differently. But I, I think that is part of VMware's definition of software defined. Infrastructure, software defined storage, is that they would say, and I think that some of the other companies in the market would say, that if, if, if it doesn't run on top of the hypervisor, then it can't be software defined. Yeah, but. Is that true? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> so there we have a That's retarded. You know, why can't I run under the hypervisor? Yeah, yeah. Well, Scale runs, GPFS, like, scale yeah. runs GPFS underneath, not on yes. top. Yeah. Why is yes. software running underneath not software defined? And software running on top is software it's defined. It's still software. Yeah, if you're saying it's a yes. hyper, if you're saying it's hypervisor defined software uh, yes. storage, well then maybe. But you know, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, if you take that server and you put the put Windows on it and the I, Windows iSCSI initiator, uh, iSCSI target. Well, yeah. that's software defined software. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's software defined something. I mean, it's not something I really want to use in production, but it fits the definition. Investment community is really excited about software defined anything these days. Software defined buzzword. <laughs> software defined buzzword. Well, I think specifically. How much did Nick or Well, no. <laughs> when you when you think about it, though, you know, there's this whole DevOps movement in IT, which is saying, you know, the twelve of us to, or I didn't even count right, but the large number of us. <laughs> Being you know, the large number of us were set to accomplish a task, it might have taken five different guys to build this environment at a customer. And the ability to expose those, those APIs, those software calls, to be able to utilize, you know, someone will post, this is how you build, someone will eventually post a script utilizing an API of how to make that happen on, on anyone's server. And that's the value of the software definition of right. applications and infrastructure. I yeah, I agree with that. I mean, really, one of the goals on, on you know where we want to take this thing, like like you said, you're literally writing a script on top of this platform. We see this thing. This is a platform. The iPhone is a platform. Three birds. That's an application. You got basically any application that could be like delivered on a platform. This is built for just a general purpose. You know, IT infrastructure delivery platform. You can write a script that's going to like, look, I'm going to deploy two ADS servers. I'm going to do exchange in a highly available environment and create a SharePoint server, and I'm going to roll that out to all my customers. 
you can create a script to do the thing on that. And, and that's where the real value comes of basically in having this platform on which you can deliver applications. And I mean, that's really our goal with what we're trying to deliver with this thing. I mean, this is, this is the first iteration of it, so. Yeah, so where does this go from here? You wanna, you wanna spill the beans on that, Jason? <laughs> so what's version two gonna look like? Let's first do, uh, so so there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of you know points between you know, like version one which is what we're releasing today and and you know version two there's a lot of things that are going to come like the whole like we're talking about software defined networking piece we've got a very specific plan for what a software defined networking piece is going to look like um, the the biggest thing is for us we still need a switch to plug into if we can eliminate the need for a switch by having the nodes themselves become the switches, that's a great thing. I mean, that's, that, that, that is going to basically further lower the cost. And when you think of these nodes as being independent, you know, switching devices that can be interconnected to each other and then connect out to different you know, pieces of the network, that, that's, that adds a lot of value. That piece is, is, is a very specific core focus for our next development effort. Because when you're thinking about the data center, well, you know, what are those, those those tenants of the data center? You've got basically storage, servers, networking, you know, and then you you know toss that virtualization stack as like like that fourth fourth layer. The one piece that we're missing to have like is, is that highly defined networking piece. If we can get that piece in there, then that will be awesome. Well, that makes it simple. <laughs> <Like, laughs> It completes the, the whole it path does. of delivering infrastructure yeah. as an appliance. Yeah. Right? If, if you don't need the switch anymore, then, yeah, then yeah. you've got the whole stuff. Yeah. And that's, yeah. of course, why VMware made the move that they just did. Yeah. Yeah. And why Cisco exactly. announced what they did at uh, yeah. Cisco Live. I mean, everybody realizes that the network is going to be a key component of future infrastructure Absolutely. in the virtualization space. And it's not yeah. enough to just have a dumb virtual hub. You have to have a real virtual switch with real SDN. Yeah. Yeah. Well, certainly at some scale. You know, I, and I, it's, I question how small yeah. that scale. Well, but yeah. even even yeah. in a small scale, yeah. you have to via software, via their web interface. So simple things. I got to sign an IP yeah. to a virtual machine, and in, in many of the implementations of like a virtual switch or or a stack quantum, that assignment uh, out of you know I have a range of ten IPs which VM does it go to. Um, that's actually defined in the virtual so in the software networking layer. So they, they do have to address it to be able to address the distributed hyper, uh, hypervisor with distributed storage in one compute environment. It absolutely has to be addressed. And it, it's interesting, like, what layers? You know, like, you, you start stepping through the basically the seven layers of the OC model, and, and basically where, where do certain things make sense? And we found, the, like, for our market, there are very specific things that, guess what, you don't need. I mean, you don't need a software-defined networking stack to look like iOS. It doesn't have to look like basically the latest iteration of iOS, because guess what? 95% of the people don't use that shit. Yeah. That's, and that happens in a lot of things. So really, and one of the things that you know, I've actually found, this has been kind of this interesting, enlightened period of, of creating this converged, converged infrastructure, is when you simplify, when you simplify, when you simplify that stack, when you make everything easier, all that crap that was created to basically make all this shit work together doesn't matter. All that stuff, and when you look at this, and you look at those software features of like what's in this, you know, very complex switching environment, you don't need half that crap when you simplify the entire stack yeah, back yeah, down into have something the story, easy. Right, we'll have it you yeah. go into the product and yes, you know, we, it'll be high SCSI or whatever as external storage, but if you use it in the converged fashion, right, whatever tools you had to put together before to manage storage protocols, yeah. you don't need it all because but, they but, don't exist. Yeah, and you have to remember, when you're building a general purpose product, a customer comes around and goes, I need this, and so it gets in. Uh, and if you're Cisco, bigger. that happens 73,000 times. <laughs> exactly. And now yeah. you start going, well, I'm designing this for a particular use case, and so yep. 63,000 of those 73,000 customers will never do yeah, this. Never do that. So, so, and so I don't need that feature that's there for that. Yeah. It's picking the, the stuff that you think is going yeah. to match the market. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> We have a lull. A lull. It's like, and, it, and it got completely silent. All, 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 all of it. <laughs> sure. um, are you going to be implementing you know, OpenStack on your platform? Mm, 
Mm, maybe. Maybe. Which really is Grizzly or Colson? <laughs> maybe Cloud's <Clownsnake. laughs> Yeah, see, you know, I, I mean, I look at that. It's, that's a whole different market. You know, if, I, if I got a 60 user SMB, they're not interested in automating the creation of virtual servers because they got six. And next year they'll add two. And it would take longer to write the scripts and generate the infrastructure to automate the creating of those two than to create then two. To create the two. Well, Which would be why they buy a product that it's already pre-automated, pre-scripted. I mean, that's a segment of our of our customer base and our targeted customer base. But but you know, we're comfortable up to you know 500 employees, and, and we've got customers that are bigger than that. We have customers that are smaller than 20, right? So you know, our our curve is pretty flat, though. The interesting thing for you know uh, 90. I think 98% of our customers are between or are below $99 million in sales and below 500. So we're we're targeted at where we think we should be targeted. Yeah. So now you know we talked about SMB for the most part. I mean, what about the NIC um, areas that you might be able to fit into and SME or enterprise? Yeah. Like, Spaces or Remote office, branch yeah, office. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of a that, that's kind of just a natural fit for it, and uh, it, we'll we'll see when it comes up. But I mean, we've got a few, you know, you know, big accounts that have been kind of, you know, like in that that era of you know, like so, like Library Congress, yeah, Motorola, library Congress, stuff NASA. like that, NASA, you know, things like that. But it's very project based. So, so within those enterprise, like it, like the NASA one's a prime example. It's like a satellite that's going to launch in twenty twenty seven. You know, like here we needed basically a scalable storage platform, like go in there. And I mean, that that's what we went into yeah, that. One way. of the things that kind of sprung to my mind is when you start talking about PCI compliance. Yeah. And one of the things that always comes up is, you know, they want to put some sort of uh, appliance, virtual appliance or whatever, right. just in between zones, right? Right. And maybe it's a firewall, maybe it's, you know, an application, uh, maybe it's IPS, you know, whatever these are. Mm -hmm. and, you know, do you really want to spend 100 grand between each zone just to haul those three VMs, you know, or whatever? Right, 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 right. Right. So, I mean, you think, you know, a cost solution that, yeah. you know, can haul some of these applications. And, take a small footprint. and really, it is like I'll, I'll see a pad agrees with me here, but uh, really, the uh, the thing is, like, if we've got our partners that are willing to basically take it into those kind of kind of applications, that's really our delivery mechanism, as far as like basically a sales channel to, to, to get in there. It's and, and all of those deals that we've actually done with some of the larger companies have all been through basically our value added resellers. 100%. If they've got a need for it, I think we've got, you know, we got, we got a solution that's going to fit well in that market. So. We've got quite a few regulated customers, even though we're at we're SME or, you know, SMB, depending on the size. Mm -hmm. But we have, we have quite a few uh, mid market banks, um, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of GLDA and in, 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 uh, credit unions and, uh, you know, and smaller community banks, you know, Bank of the, o Bank of the Ozarks, five, mm -hmm. uh, you know, five. Uh, Branch Bank and you know, a bunch of these different kind of uh, smaller guys. Also, a lot of healthcare, so there's a lot of HIPAA there. Um, and you know, you you know um, as well as, as anybody that if you're um, if you're a small bank, you're regulated by the exact same thing that JP Morgan Chase and no. Goldman Sachs are. More it, so. do, it doesn't yeah. it, it doesn't make any difference. You have the same problem those guys do. So yeah, yeah. Have, except if, except if you're a community bank and you screw up, you go to jail. <laughs> yeah. no, nobody in Goldman Sachs ever goes to jail. <laughs> As opposed to get bailed out by a target group. <laughs> well, another challenge is, you know, generally you're not staff or, you know, mm -hmm. you've got less to do. You have much less to do the job. In fact, that's an interesting point. We, we do a lot in, in small manufacturing. So we've got, you know, a lot of steel, you know, guys that fabricate steel. And one of our customers is the, these guys do these specialized uh, uh, mixers called Vitamix. They're a customer of okay. ours. And uh, you know, but guys like that, um, you know, uh, uh, those guys, they have the uh, they have the absolute lowest percentage of IT staff to to regular staff. Typically, it's not unusual at all to find, or even in oil and gas and some of these other areas, to find you know a couple thousand people in the company, and we might be their infrastructure. They might have two full-time IT people. I mean, yeah. You guys, you guys, yeah. that that particular uh, segment is. Woefully understaffed. Yeah, I mean, manufacturing in particular, I mean, we see, you yeah. know, they may have maybe a big company and they've got, yeah. you know, VMware Enterprise Plus and, you know, uh, choose your large, expensive sand of choice. Yeah, so right? not, but they're not, not the point. 
Yeah, not, but out in rural whatever at the plant or at this oil well Some or place that like thing. Indianapolis maybe. <laughs> so yeah, but you know, out there they don't replicate that environment, right? So they look okay, better than better to have this than necessarily run five or six individual servers and things yeah, like that. Yeah, and that actually is an interesting point that you guys are not necessarily going up against VMware. You guys right. are kind of there's absolutely a use case where you could buy this product and use it as storage for VMware and maybe run a couple of VMs on it. Yeah. Which yep. is, you know, kind of a hybrid between the two, you know. Honestly, a lot of in a lot of cases you don't need Enterprise Plus for your entire infrastructure. You know? Yeah. And that's yep. that's the other thing. Yeah. Yep. I, like I said, I work in education. I'm locally on the staff. Um, we do use VMware. We do have Enterprise Plus because we need a lot of horsepower yeah. uh, with a small footprint. So our servers are jacked up with memory. Um, this could be a huge time saver for us because of just the management overhead. When you're running VMware with vCenter and you only have three guys in your team and you're managing the entire infrastructure, a lot of bells and whistles and little tweaks. You still have to babysit. Um, and it even goes back to SDN. Even though I have a small department and I only have 500 users, I actually have 3,000 users because the students. No. So I'm running almost my own small ISP on campus for the dorms. SDN could be a boom for us that would just yeah. save us a lot of time. Um, I, don't, I haven't seen how yet, but it's yeah. still all coming out. Yeah, we just yeah. decided the dorms were less trusted than the internet. <laughs> <laughs> probably the smartest thing. Okay. <laughs> facing the dorms. Protect the internet from your I'm, kids. I'm, 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 not, I'm not joking. We, we had multiple security zones, and the least trusted one was ResNet. <laughs> it was like ResNet, the public internet, the DMC. <laughs> So like, nobody protecting, protecting the internet from the door. Yeah, exactly. Protecting nobody, the internet from the kids. Nobody, like, nobody in China is trying to change the transcript. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so does anybody want to? Um, we, we've got to wrap it up a little bit. Um, I'm actually going to cut this sentence out. Does anybody want to uh, uh, wrap up? Does anybody have something they want to say before we're before we're done? Come on, somebody should say something. <laughs> Oh, it's cool, man. Well, no, I, 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 well, so it's, it's one, I actually do think this is a sign change, a kind of a sweeping change that we're going to see more of this. That uh, you guys are you guys are in the first wave, um, but not the first. Or you know, it, it's a sign of things to come, um, and that uh, yeah, no, I, I, it's I'm trying to think of an articulate way to say it, but this is our new reality. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a logical extension of of the whole stack concept. You, know, yeah. you start with. VCE, we pick the products for you. Yeah. And then we go, well, why don't we just virtualize the whole thing? At scale, we pick the software for you. Well, at scale, we just deliver this one right. box and it yeah. is the whole stack. Yeah. Yeah. We, you know, it's not, you got these servers and these switches and this storage, it's here. It's everything. Yeah. And that actually reminds me, did you guys, Stevie Chambers, <laughs> CTO of VCE, oh, yeah. and he did a great blog post. Yeah, today. Great post. I totally agree with that. He had a spectrum of things from basically the the spec stacks where it's kind of like if you buy these products they will work mm -hmm. to the integrated stacks like buy this rack full of equipment and it will work to these hyper converged products mm -hmm. that are basically the next step beyond that where it's like you buy this box it's everything need more mm -hmm. get another one need more get another one yep. that mm -hmm. is Cool. Well, and I think what it does, it changes from spending, in, you know, I'm not saying you need a million dollars to make this happen, but a large amount of money and then fractionally consume it over time. You know, not, not, not going to get, saying this is the same as cloud computing, it's far from it, but the ability to fractionally consume storage networking and virtualization resources and grow it fractionally. Yeah. And, well, and eliminate the whole integration time. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Just plug it time, time from right. I mean, box arrives on loading dock to working. Right. And sometimes, you know, the upfront cost isn't the only cost, it's the cost over time, both for management and having to take away 
your staff from doing other things, other projects. Yeah. It's not the first time in this discussion the C word's been used. I mean, I, I hate all, using it. All day. <laughs> so, so, Stephen, if you don't mind, I, I want to ask a question of these guys. Sure. Um, as we've been up talking to customers, and like I said, we've talked to hundreds of them and, and, and concentrated dose so over the past few weeks, Cloud hasn't come up with this class of customer. And I just want to know from you guys as being, you know, people who are, are looking out for, for, for the customer uh, and, and, you know, looking at trends and whatnot, what, you know, what do you think about, you know, about the, the potential tie-in? Because we haven't seen it. We haven't seen customers asking for that from us. So I, I think these customers are either going to make the decision to, to have full cloud services mm -hmm. or they're going to have them in-house. Yeah. They don't care about this hybrid or, or anything like that. So I think you could argue that this is a product. It's like all or nothing. You, you could argue you know, that. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but yeah, I would object to calling it private cloud. Because yeah. it's, it's not granular enough and it's not scalable enough. You know? And it's you know, the automation too. Honestly, it's the simplest way of providing virtualization, storage, infrastructure for those servers that you have to have on site. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, you know, three hundred million dollar business will probably close this year at five hundred, right? Well diversified all across America, and the customers in this space are—they might not be moving their virtual server, but I'll tell you right now, their mail server runs and run, it probably doesn't run on site in their infrastructure. Right. They're probably using Dropbox. You know, yeah. all their data is moved up already. Right. There's some Salesforce. <laughs> there's, well, I mean, but you know, this manufacturing company, this steel mill, right? They have a, a couple of servers that they need to run their plant, you know, some plant operations, and that can't go. They need something that's easy and cheap. Yeah, I, mean, I think hybrid cloud is you know, really what you see with most of these few sites of customers. I mean, they might be using one or two services that are in the public cloud, but the majority is going to be their own private yeah. cloud, Seems. even if it is between my, my observation has been that, you know, basically, you know, is something in the cloud, is something not in the cloud, is very application specific. I mean, it's like, do, do I have, yeah, do I have an application that's going to lend itself to running well in the cloud? Salesforce, prime example of that. Yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of software as a service. Yeah. You know, yeah. not seeing a lot of Those, infrastructure. Yeah, 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 yeah right. <laughs> scale. But, but in this market, you know, these people are just trying to run their businesses. Yeah. I mean, they don't care where the email runs as long as that as long as it runs. There's a lot of eye rolling that we've seen, right? We talked to the IT guys and we're like, so what do you guys think about about the cloud? And they're like, yeah, my boss asked me about that, right? right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's an ex plant worker, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Run the, he used to run the print presses. And yeah, he's, 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 the the nephew, he's like the nephew of the yeah. guy who started the company. And he's just trying to make it work. Yeah. And if this is the yeah. easiest path, or that's the easiest path. I think it's more yeah, about as, the scripting. As, right? opposed, yeah. as opposed to the other guy who you know is looking at software as a service as they're taking my applications away. I'm going to lose my phony baloney job. Oh. <laughs> and I think one of the for all, for all. <laughs> especially in this SMB market, is that it's cheap. So it's not yeah. necessarily the cheapest way to go, and when they see those numbers, you know, a lot yeah. of times, yeah. well, they decide what we should have your, yeah. your bar, you know, to help manage their. Well, you know, and, and I and I have worked, you know, in my consulting career, you know, at Central Soya Corporation, you know, 32 miles from nowhere, Indiana, and you know, <laughs> you can't run that plant on a cloud because the line isn't reliable enough. No, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I, I, I will show my age, but the fastest thing we could get was 56k. Yeah, hey, 56k was awesome back then. <laughs> yeah, but you bring up something interesting though about the price. It was, and you can actually run the numbers. And when you compete, when you pair Amazon against, frankly, enterprise class expensive software hardware, it is absolutely less expensive. However, especially the, where Amazon's pricing models are, when you add them all up. So, you know, they, they, they have a very complicated pricing matrix. It looks simple at first, but it, yeah. basically it, it gets you to buy more than you use. That to first. guarantee that. Well, <laughs> exactly. and, and so in this mid-market, it's actually more expensive to move an a infrastructure as a service workload up for most people, especially if you say, I'm, instead of saying, I'm going to go get you know, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of gear to make, to make a virtual machine run, but if you use the same software and tools that they're using, just fundamental, oh, well, on, 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 on fundamental level, 
you're taking the same or similar open source tools, I mean using different platforms, yeah. similar open source tools and technologies running upon a hardware to accomplish the same goal. Well, there's, so, more, there's a huge there's disconnect there. between, you know, people will insist on a certain level of infrastructure reliability within their data center and will consider outsourcing this application to somebody who's running IIS on a much less reliable platform. Yeah, you know, if you start looking at, you know, I will only use EMC storage with SAS drives inside my data center, but I will send my data to S3. Yeah. You know, and and it's like, if I built storage in my data center that looked kind of like the way S3 does storage, it would be a lot cheaper than if I only did it on a Symmetrix. Which a lot of people are starting to do. People, but the vast majority of corporate America is unwilling to consider bringing that crap into their data center? Well, that just goes to what Jason said, right? It's about the application. If you've yeah. got to have that, if that application not only has to run, but has to run and be performant, you've got to have your hand on it. You've got to at least be able to touch it in some form or fashion. It's one of the reasons why the, in, you know, an exceedingly high percentage of the VMs that are, that are at uh, Amazon are dev, right? right? Mm -hmm. And not, and not, and not production. If I'm a, a small, mid-sized company, I've got you know, 30 or 40 servers, and for whatever reason, 20 or 30 of them need to run on site. You get to the point where it's not even worth thinking about moving the other 10 to the cloud. Well, it's, not worth, it's not worth the cost of putting the T3 line it's not worth to, make, to make yeah, them run on the Well, no, but if you lower the barrier to entry and the cost necessary to run your infrastructure is sufficient level, yeah. that it's more hassle to run it somewhere else and on site, you're going to. People, and especially in that space, will take the path less for the resistance. Yeah. And I, I've also noticed a lot of those people are just not terribly, you know, they don't understand the risk enough to trust the cloud providers. Yeah. They don't, it's like, I, if, if my not very competent IT guys run it, at least it's under my control. And if I send it off to a cloud guy, somebody will steal my data. That being said, mm -hmm. I, I have to say, um, looking at the market and you have really good data, um, this year's been really eye opening. Well, I'm growing my business dramatically. I'm taking bigger bites to the pie and growing the business. I can clearly see that sometime in the future, that if, 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 if all of us don't change how and what we do, that next bite's going to come up empty. Are these commercial customers, these mid-market customers, are changing? Their workloads are changing. The workloads are shifting. They are changing how they consume. Um, it, it's forcing events like this of changing how or what technologies we bring to solve the problem. But it's absolutely changing, and, and, and saying they care about compliance or availability, I frankly see a stick in the head in the sand because um, just talk to your customers, ask them to show you where their files are. It's not on their file server. You know, yeah. it's one example. It's measurable. Ask them whether ask them if they use Dropbox. Yeah. Who uses Dropbox? <laughs> exactly. Who has corporate data on Dropbox? Exactly. That presentation I just loved tonight. Dropbox. <laughs> <laughs> but we are the reality. Yeah. About half of us have made the move. <laughs> All right, I have to I have to cut it off. Sorry, we've got the expert meeting to go to in ten minutes. And I promised John Troyer we would talk. And nobody lets Troyer down. You know, you know where it is. And tell him I said sorry. Stephen, you know where it is, right? No. Okay, because I talk about it in a minute. Okay. All right. Thank you again for watching this roundtable discussion about scale computing's new HC3 converged compute device. Once again. We are Tech Field Day delegates, members of the Scale Computing staff. Um, thank you very much for inviting us in, for supporting uh, Tech Field Day's uh, roundtable discussions and work here at VMworld. Um, you guys have been a huge, huge help to us and to getting people here to VMworld. So thank you very much. And thank you guys for showing up and sharing your opinions and sharing your knowledge here on this roundtable. For more videos like this, go to techfieldday.com, and to learn more about scale computing, go to scalecomputing.com. Once again, I'm Stephen Foskin. Thank you.